Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, today is World Data Privacy Day and uh, we decided with our friends from Colibra to have here Stan Christians as one of the co-founders of Colibra to have a nice chat about uh, what is the what happens in the world of data and specifically what happens in the world of data connected to privacy and protection and um, I know if you know me from my previous <laughs> webinars and discussion with you I can talk for hours about this so uh, the marketing team in Colibra has kindly provided with you know nice flashcards so we can keep <laughs> honest to the time so we don't take too much of your time so it's going to be a quick round of questions and answers so I have some and Stan has some and we'll, the idea will be to really take you through a little bit our thinking and uh, where we see th things going. Morning, Sam. How are you? Hey, morning, Roberto, and uh, thanks for having us over. Um, uh, I'm really happy to be here, uh, especially because it's the World Privacy Day. And I think we cannot have enough uh, awareness of privacy these days because it affects us all. It affects our, our family. It affects everything around us. We're just not always aware of how uh, far these consequences can go. I know you talk more uh, a lot about data citizenships and us being all data citizens. Give them a bit more an understanding what it is, what does it mean? Yeah, so a number of years ago at Colibra, we said, um, hey, let's start to talk about data citizens. And we gave it a very simple definition. We said a data citizen is everyone who uses data to do their job. Um, and in today's organizations, that means that's a lot of people everyone, who do their job. All of us. <laughs> exactly. I, I don't know. I can probably count 20 people in the company that don't do that, right? But uh, <laughs> maybe, we, we all... maybe the, the higher you go, the less you use it. You never know. Uh, no, hopefully true. the more you use it. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's not true. Yeah, of course. That's but for example, data, but... In, in our company, like we're a software company, right? So we have people doing product management, we have people doing support, we have people doing sales. And in product management, the way you build software data is important. Like, hey, how are people using the software? Which features are they liking? Are they finding their, their way around the software quick enough? That's all shown through data. So data is determining prioritization. For example, in support, what's the most important ticket I have to solve today? Uh, if you're in sales, you say, okay, how are we going to divide the territories uh, for the representatives across the geographies to say how many do we need where? So yeah. for all of these business functions, you you use data, data almost on a daily basis. Yeah, and I, and I like the concept also because one of the uh, things that I think data needs is to break those, I call them tribes, right? I'm, don't, don't talk about silos anymore. I mean, it's the tribes that you know, inherently are formed in a company which people are basically kind of jealous of their things and information because information is power. And, uh, <laughs> and so I guess the the, the uh, talking about citizenship naturally will introduce something is more like what are the rights and duties of for you to be part of that ensemble, right? That what, what are the, in your ideas, right and duties for uh, the citizenship? Yes, indeed. Uh, if, if, if you're starting to hear, okay, am I a data citizen? That also immediately applies, what does that mean for me? And then you come to rights and responsibilities. So there are certain things you, you can expect as a citizen, right? Like, hey, what is being done for me? What infrastructure is in place? Uh, how can I know that uh, data that I'm receiving is trusted? But then there's also certain responsibilities. For example, let's say that you are building reports or uh, sharing a, a spreadsheet of data with your colleagues. There's responsibilities there because if you're building a report, you want to make sure that you're not putting bias in the report so that people make the wrong decisions. If you're sharing a, a spreadsheet over email or maybe over some network drive or other way, you want to make sure that you're aware that maybe there's personal data in the spreadsheet and you shouldn't just put it on, 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 on the network uh, where maybe it becomes a risk that somebody finds it and uses it in the wrong way. So it's both the role, the rights and the responsibilities. I like that because it's actually a uh, kind of a, a more uh, humanistic visualization of what you and me probably talk all the time about lineage and provenance, right? Because uh, it's, not, it's not just simple, the data that goes from one place to another to another, but it's more like a person that does something here that is actually 
going to have a, a an effect or an impact of someone is downstream and so that everyone is kind of a chained by this supply that data supply chains are actually data you know supply chains of people that are exchanging information so it definitely creates that you know you can't make you know the water polluted upstream without affecting the people downstream so you have a right and a duty to to keep this water you know pure I mean, exactly we, we, yeah. exactly for yes. us at, at colibra there's like data is almost data is meaningless without humans to interpret it right so right. if you have a database and like you have a data lake or a data warehouse and you're focusing on the technical aspect of data and you're forgetting the humanistic the people aspect then you have no interpretation right then you have yeah no no insight then you have no action uh, then you have no communication so people are fundamental to doing something with data yeah and I did, nowadays i think uh, I, I like to talk also about the digital humanism the way I, the, I, I talk about i think about it is this almighty or uh, all uh, all singing all dancing technology in effect is pushing in the forefront you know the human Right. Some, sometimes, most of the time in a company now, humans are really the difference between a very good data strategy and not so good data strategy because it's how the human are able to digest and to use the data that will make a difference. So, yeah, you can have the best tools in the world. You can have the best process in the world. But in the end, if nobody is adopting it, what do you do? Uh, if I understood correctly, Roberto, from the last time we spoke, uh, trust is very important uh, at Schneider, right? So, Absolutely. Um, and especially in the World Privacy Day, like if I go to the doctor uh, or if I go to my bank, I'm trusting them that they will not abuse my information. I'm trusting them also to give me the right information and the right service. Um, so how do, you, how do you, at Schneider, how do you or your organization, how do you help um, bring trust in data? Well, the, I think if you think at the nuts and bolts of what trust is, I trust something because I, it's almost, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of a sensorial thing and a kind of an emotional thing, I would say. So how do I trust something? It's because I see it, because I can experience it. Because, and then when I see it and experience it, so that thing is transparent to me, I, it's actually explainable to me. Then emotionally, I can say, okay, I, I, I'm okay with it. It's something that I trust that whatever is going to be the usage, whatever is going to be the purpose, that is not going to done uh, beyond my the, my expectation. And I think mm. that's the the whole point of putting at the center of our data access operating model an ability to collect. Every time we touch data, we collect a little bit more what the data is. Every time we touch data, we fix it a bit more of what data should be. Every time and and continuously, consistently, we're trying to push out and to publish and to make it available to people, to the data citizens, the a clear understanding of what it is, and that mm. creates trust. Not only creates trust, but because the the uh, that's where connected to the overall company strategy, trust will fuel growth. Because mm -hmm. if I trust you, then I believe that what you're doing for me is the best. So I'm ready to engage with you. And that's not just internally, but also externally. And if you roll this forward from, or you, you expand to what is gonna be more like a business world, you know, most of what the, 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 the chain, the next generation of value will come from more trust because there are things we can't do today simply because we don't trust each other in, in exchanging data. So the more, and of course, and if this happens between businesses, you can imagine how, the citizens and people that are really having no clue uh, most of the time on how we use their data will trust us. So there is a value chain that is enabled by the trust because mm. the more I trust you and the more I feel that if my trust comes, you know, if you, I don't trust you anymore, I have some power to revoke that, so remove from the, that data from your processing, the more people will have, will probably believe that they can give more because Today we don't give more because we don't trust we get it we can get it back. So, <laughs> and in, internally to Schneider, I think the main thing is enabling reusability. So I trust this data is good enough for me because I can see it, I measure it, I, it's, the specification are okay. Therefore, I don't need to ask you to rebuild it. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. So I think that I, I heard two parts in what you said, Roberto. One one part was. Trust is almost a continuous thing, right? So it's, you yeah. have to make it part of the process. Like you're yeah. always making the data better. You're always increasing the trust. 
but then a second part what you said was also it's um it's a human thing almost like let's say i'm an executive and you're giving me a data or a report i trust you right like you've always given me good data you've always given me good reports the data has always come from some important system so i trust what you're giving me because i know you right i i trust you so i trust your your work product but if i zoom in on that part a little bit like how would you verify that like i trust you but if let's say i wanted to check what you're giving me is correct how could i verify that well that's that's a matter of uh, agreeing on what type of a uh, structure what type of information we want to give at the surrounding of the the uh, the trust when you buy a product right for example you can see that as a picture right mm -hmm. but then there are many things that are going with this product in terms of feature in terms of and uh, and in terms of uh, you know reviews of other people, so there is a combination of feature, and the the the, the richer is the feature set, the more trustable, the more uh, digestible from an emotional point of view it will be, because ultimately even buy a product in this case probably would be choosing the right data set for you. It's still pretty much an emotional thing in the end, because I, I always say I can build a truth machine, <laughs> a truth machine as we were saying, is might be too philosophical because they might, I, might, I might feel that the truth machine is my aim, but truth is something that people, you know, might feel that is right or wrong for them. Instead, if we build the trust machine, something that is giving you enough to believe that what you're seeing is right for you, then then you do the, ex, the last mile, which is, okay, then I'll actually use it for my decision. I believe that this will lead me to the best decision I can. And so I think it's about to make it feature rich and by feature enriched in a way that is talking to the business sense, to the business outcome. So you need to talk to the people that are consuming data for what they need, mm. not for what the data is per se, because you don't want to express your, uh, your product in terms of how many customers, you know, addresses are, you know, perfect, but you want to say, how how much your consumption or your action of consumption will be enabled by that. So it's a tricky passage, but it's a tricky it's a tricky thing to achieve, but it's necessary. So you need to transform that. Yeah, and I like what you said about the, the truth machine, which seems like something from uh, a fantasy world, it uh, is. which you maybe can never achieve, but a trust machine seems uh, a lot more realistic and a lot more practical and pragmatic as well. Um, you and me know that there's a lot of privacy regulations. I think they're only going to grow, by the way. We'll, we will only see more, which is a good thing in itself, but also comes with a lot of challenges. So if you look back at the last couple of years, maybe for you, what do you think can or cannot be done under these privacy regulations? And how does, um, how does a software like Codibra, how does a service like Codibra help you support those efforts? Uh, regulations are the funny thing about regulation after uh, almost 20 years spent in uh, financial services you realize at a certain point that regulation wants one thing from you good data so the regulator is not going to come and count how many machine you have in a in an office or how many computers are the regulator will give you what would like you to give something that from their point of view answer questions with believability again trust, trust mm -hmm. again so so the and that, so the finally these re new regulations are moving completely away from a prescription of what it is and I'm starting to insist on principles mm. and the the problem with principles is to be good at principles you need to be really good <laughs> you, can't, you can't fake it right so, and uh, and so privacy again I think GDPR is a, an alarm bell GDPR told mm. us you remember all those good things you should have done in the last ten years for the customers. You should have. So, and so people are now catching up with that. And I think the best thing you can do in this environment is stop thinking about regulation. Something happens at the end, mm -hmm. and start to think about regulation. Something happens because of what you do. So the something that has been in uh, in the mind of the bankers for a while, but difficult to to, uh, to 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 realize that compliance by outcome. So because of the way I do things, I'm also complying, mm -hmm. and I'm very much trying to. And it's neither we've been trying, well, there's or definitely a element of the privacy regulation or privacy by design that makes you think about that. But then you have to have the mechanisms inside to really make it happen. So, mm. 
and those mechanisms will be much, much better and much more efficient if they can rely on a source of uh, trust from what the company really is from its data. So Colibra brings us the possibility of creating a corporate memory of who we are from mm -hmm. our data. And once that is you know, achieved at the, le at the decent level of precision and definition, then you are starting to become incredibly more agile to respond to regulation because you see things and you, you can apply to the things you see in your company described as organizational metadata, the mm -hmm. angle that the regulator wants, and you can provide the right question. So the, the right answer. So the, the, that's where the Colibra helps us because provide us the those that internal view, that third eye, that um, you know, know thyself moment that gives us the ability to answer correctly questions. But right. It's a long journey, it's a long journey. Right. So essentially, you're saying uh, it it uh, helps you in a certain way of working, yeah. right? Which is giving your business the certain the outcomes that you need. But the way of working also guarantees that when the regulator comes and says, "Hey, how are you doing this related to data and privacy?" You're already having the answers almost ready, if you will. Yeah, the, it, it's all a matter of uh, how complete you are and how much, how quickly you can gain. So there is a critical mass to achieve, and it's a long journey to achieve it. But reality is, start to think not to comply to regulation. The, the, the having Colibra gives us the ability to not to think about just complying to regulation, but while we're compliant with the, to regulation, we're also becoming a better business because we we understand better where our risks are. We understand our where our data is. We can actually start to infer what is going to happen to us if something happens. So that's where the uh, we are trying to shift the needle. But I, as I say, it's it's a it's a long journey. Yeah, so that's the third eye that you meant, is like yeah. the transparency, the understanding of yes. how you're actually working. So, explain to our to our audience in Schneider what data intelligence is. Um, so, um, our definition as a company of what data intelligence is is that it's about connecting the right data to the right you know, insights algorithms, people, and ultimately outcomes. Yeah. Um, because a lot of times when organizations speak about data, that they, it's like, oh, let's put it in the warehouse and let's put AI on top of it and so on and so forth. And this is all nice and it can even be fun. Sometimes it can be hard, but in the end, you're doing this for certain outcomes, like more growth, cost savings, uh, less risk, and so on. So for me, a data intelligent organization is uh, an organization that um, is continuously improving itself in doing just that, right? So that means that uh, data is is not something that you see anymore as as a as a byproduct or even worse as an exhaust. Like you know, you're doing certain um, parts of your business, you're making products, you're delivering service to your customers, and data is just like ah, it's in my way. I have to fill out this form in some system. Um, and it's, you know, just send the, the spreadsheet to somebody else. It's, it's like you, you want to get it out of the way. You want to you get rid of the exhaust. But it is not an exhaust, right? Data is itself a valuable asset. You're buying a lot of technology to like warehouses and lakes and ETL tools and archiving. You're hiring people, analysts who do all sorts of stuff with this data. So data is itself an asset. And uh, I think a data intelligent organization knows, okay, what are the assets that I have? Just like you're doing, for example, for the talent assets people, you have an HR organization, right, who are taking care of, of people. And of course, some things they do well, some things they, they do not so well, but you're always trying to improve how your people asset is being managed. Same thing for the money assets, for example, Imagine that you are the, the CFO of Schneider Electric. You're really v going to be very careful about money as an asset, like how much money we have, where is it going to, who is spending it, who's giving the approvals on it actually being spent. And you're making everybody in the company also think about money through budgets, through planning and other ways. And in a data intelligent organization, it's the same thing. 
they also think about the data asset. So okay. think about it like this. Which no waste. Assets do no, I data, no data waste, right? Ideally, yes. You're, yeah. trying to, uh, you're trying to reduce how much uh, uh, so, data is waste. Yeah. So and there's also a kind of a... There's also kind of a sensorial intelligence, right? Because like you have a different type of intelligence. The data intelligence that doesn't waste is the data that the intelligence that actually can capitalize in every single thing that happens everywhere, right? Because we sometimes we think very much about IoT, the mm -hmm. one that happens, or sensors in a in a room or your uh, you know Alexa and so. But the reality, if you think about that way in terms of sensor, like a person that does something on a computer and they are producing something, that's again, as a sensor producing data. And that's, um, and most of the time it gets wasted. But uh, imagine if you can harness all of that, right? And you, you basically your intelligence is, you know, incredibly uh, augmented and incredibly fast because you are literally not wasting one drop of data is produced in the company. Yeah, yeah exactly. And then, you know, that's, that's now you have this map of all the, the data that you have in your company, but then you also have to know, okay, who can access this data, for what purpose, how is it flowing? And this, this kind of map together with the process and the roles and responsibilities around it allows you to navigate your business to better outcomes. And that's and a data them, intelligent organization. And one of them, of course, would be privacy, right? Because if I know things, I have, I run fewer risk or lower risks because and one of the risk being privacy risk if i know where my data goes to the third party why that third party is using it and what is it for i can actually mitigate any privacy risk because i will put more security and more uh, you know measures around that that's kind of the way exactly the two going exactly and the some intelligence is... i know if i know i can mitigate a risk right exactly the risk is very real because there's this beautiful visualization uh, I think it's from Data is Beautiful or something. If you Google it, uh, Google Data Breaches Visualization. Data, data is Beautiful. Data is Beautiful, yes. And it shows how over time, over the last, I think, 10 or 20 years, in bubbles, how the, the data breaches, the bubbles are becoming bigger. Bigger. So more data is being lost or stolen, and they're becoming more frequent. Yeah. But this is this is a big problem, right? Because you're just going about your way as a non-data intelligent organization. Data is being spread all over the map. It becomes easier for people to steal it or for organizations to lose it. And that exposes yourself to unknown risks. So you are a technologist, you're a visionary, you, you've been, a, must have a passion for data. So where is this thing taking us? From a, if we extrapolate what we're doing, if we extrapolate that intelligence, where do you see this going for uh, us, humanity, you know, Colibra, the world? What do you think? Uh, that's a big question. So I think uh, the trend in the market is that more data will be produced, measured, captured, and more people will try to get value in the right ways, but also in the wrong ways of that data. If maybe you as an organization are not doing it or not doing it enough, then somebody else will do it for you, right? So it will happen in the market uh, regardless. Um, and I think uh, there's challenges with it. One, organizations have to get ready. They have to become data intelligent. Two, more regulations will come and they will, if you look even at the last three, five years, GDPR is the alarm bell, you said, the wake up call. In the meantime, we're tracking at least over 50 regulations worldwide. So I'm expecting more on, on regulation. Date, specifically on data, specifically on data, Specifically right? on data, specifically on data privacy. Because data is an asset, data is important. So people are trying to say, well, well, hang on a second. This is uh, important for my like, economy, right? Exactly. Uh, like if you yeah. do this, then, okay, it may be beneficial for you in the short term, but it's not so great for the society as a whole in the long yeah. term, right? So they're trying to put regulations. More will come. And I think... Um, the one of the most exciting technologies that uh, are out there that are that have the potential to be very disruptive um, is the the decentralized uh, technology. Uh, right. So right now data works as follows, right? You you go online, you use some kind of service, and the data goes into the database that is owned by this other company, right? So right. they own the database, so they think that they also own the data, but at least they control it because it's inside their system and they bought the system, they pay for the server. But when you look at the decentralized uh, technology, decentralized web is one of those, they're actually saying the data is not in the database, 
the data is inside the network. And if you're connecting to the network, you have access to the data that me as an individual, I have given you access to by giving you a key or a token or an encryption. So now I can access only the data that you that I am allowing you to access for the purpose that we agreed on. And if you're not behaving properly, then I shut off the access. Okay, and you don't so have that, the this is the key to data sovereignty, basically. Basically giving uh, people got the power again <laughs> with this, right? So, and, and to what we were saying before, this will unlock more trust because if I can withdraw the trust easily and confidently, I will trust you with more, right? So, and we, we're gonna have better value. That's very interesting. Hopefully, so, yes, hopefully. The technology is still very early. It will take a while, but um, we'll see how it evolves over the next, let's say, five years or so. Well, you're talking to the guy that remembers the day one came to his office. I said, Mr. Maranka, look at this. Now we can send up to 140 characters from one mobile to another. So <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Almost 160. So it's it's amazing how much I've seen data things we're now changing, right? Doing, right? So nowadays, the power I can get as a normal citizen through whatever service out there. In my days when I started, it would have been a dream that would have cost billions for a for a company to achieve. So I think the sky is the limit, not even that, right? Yes, so the technology is enormously going to advance as it has over the last couple of decades. But the challenge is that we as humans, we don't evolve that fast. Right? No, so you're right. we have to teach ourselves how to um, like consume and digest the data better into insights and outcomes. Because otherwise we're going to get confused and make wrong decisions or accept information for real that's actually false and so on and so forth. So we really have to, as humans, adapt to the technology that's changing so quickly around us. It's fascinating because we are at the same time the limiting factor and the success factor of this, aren't we? Correct, correct. Well, that's, I'm afraid, that's all we had time to do to discuss today. But um, Stan, thank you very much for being part of this little uh, spiel. It's been uh, fascinating and very entertaining having a chat with you. And of course, we're gonna have other chats, but. Uh, for today, for uh, from myself, Roberto Maranca, and Stan Christians, uh, we on the data world, data privacy day. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.